This is the Radford Lecture, and the Radford Lecture is um, one of AARE's awards and is bestowed upon an educational researcher who has made a significant contribution to Australian um, research. The Radford Lecture is named after um, Bill Radford. Um, and I'll just tell you a little bit about um, Bill Radford before I introduce the, um, the Radford Lecture. In the words of Kim Beasley Senior, who was a, the Federal Minister for Education in 1978, who gave the very first Radford Address, he stated that William Croakley Radford is part of the heritage, heritage of Australian education. Bill Radford had been, um, in 1946, an assistant director of ACER, and in 1955 became the organisation's director. He was president um, in, from 1969 to 71, and an honorary fellow in 1976 of the Australian College of Education, and he was a president of AARE in 1974. One of the um, great joys in introducing the Radford Lecture is that Bill Radford was appointed by the Queensland Government in 1969 to chair a committee whose report led to the abol abol abolition of external examinations in Queensland. I arrived in Queensland from England in 1972 at the very moment when external ab exams were abolished. I could not have been more joyful and grateful to um, Bill Radford. In 1972, Monash University conferred on Radford an honorary um, Doctor of Laws, and the Australian and New Zealand Association for the Advancement, Advancement of Science awarded him its Mackey Medal. Radford was a foundation member of AARE in 1970, and as a consequence of his long record of commitment to promoting and encouraging research in education and his close association with AARE, it was decided at the November meeting of the executive in 1977 that as a memorial to Radford, one of the lectures at the annual conference should henceforth be de designated the Radford Lecture. Which brings me to introducing the Radford Lecture this year. I was told not to mix my papers up with that lecture. Um, <laughs> um, so it's with great pleasure that I can introduce um, Professor Jenny Gore to give this year's um, Radford. Many of you will have read her bio in the, um, in the um, conference book. But I, so I won't read it all out, but Jenny is a professor in the School of Education at the University of Newcastle, Australia, where she's currently director of the Teachers and Teaching Research Centre and chief editor of the international journal Teacher and Teacher Education. I have to say that um, there was a point in my academic career when it was first starting as a PhD student that Jenny's work actually was a bit of a disaster for me because I was going to do all this work on critical pedagogy and then I picked up this book on feminism and critical pedagogy by Jennifer Gore and Carmen Luke which destroyed my whole proposal. I had to go back and rewrite the whole thing. Um, so thank you, Jenny. Um, so, um, but then it was a great um, pleasure for me in 1998, I think it was, to actually work on a, a project with, um, with Jenny, which was a significant one in Queensland at that time. So Jenny, we're really looking forward to this um, lecture, and um, I'll pass the stage over to you, and I haven't taken any of your notes. <laughs> uh, thanks, Martin, and um, thank you to the AARE executive for selecting me to um, deliver this year's lecture. It really is a very great honour and in fact quite daunting to follow in the footsteps of Bill Radford and um, so many other great Radford lecturers. I feel quite humbled to have been given this honour. I do want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, um, pay my respects to elders past and present and uh, acknowledge all other Aboriginal people here today. I'd like to also acknowledge my colleagues in the School of Education at the University of Newcastle and particularly those in the Centre for uh, the Research Centre for Teachers and Teaching, um, uh, who make every day a pleasure um, to be at work. Uh, and finally, before I begin, I want to acknowledge so many other people in the room who, at various points in my career, which I hope is not over, um, uh, have um, shown small signs and large signs of encouragement, support, given me advice, challenged me in ways that I think have led to this moment 
um, and I think you know who you are. Um, perhaps many of you don't even know who you are because there are so many small gestures that go into, I think, um, how we all feel about the work we're doing. I hope that I can pay that forward um, into the future. So um, I'm going to try and whiz through this in less than 45 minutes, but I hope I still have around about that time. Um, so hopefully you can stay with me. I want to thank all of you for coming along when there are many other options that um, you could be filling your afternoons with. So picture me, if you will, on the day of my PhD defence at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, needing a haircut and looking pretty tired. I was a mess of emotions, sitting in a room with Ken Zeichner, Liz Ellsworth, Tom Popkowitz and Michael Apple, all highly esteemed academics in their respective fields, feeling privileged, nervous, excited, a barrage of questions ensued, mostly expected and supportive, almost friendly. And I felt a quietly growing sense of confidence that I would indeed make it home for Christmas. And then the completely unanticipated question that caused me to draw in breath with a mixture of terror and disbelief. How do you reconcile writing a post-structural critique of critical and feminist pedagogy with the fact that people are starving in the streets. To reconcile in this moment meant to justify, to account for my intellectual choices, my ambitions, my contribution, not just to the academy, but to society. In a different way, my father, who was a highways department surveyor, asked the same kind of question when he read my thesis summarised my three years in the making Foucauldian analysis in a single sentence which was shockingly accurate and asked why didn't I do something useful like in special education. It sounds harsher than I remember but with an intellectually disabled sister I wanted to believe he spoke from a caring place. Not much later, upon returning to Australia, I was invited to give a seminar on my PhD at a Queensland university. It was my first ever speaking gig, apart from a couple of conference presentations. The usual seminar structure unfolded, the 45-minute presentation in which I articulated my argument post-PhD with a growing sense of authority over the ideas, followed by the obligatory question and answer session. I recall none of the questions posed. But in the post-presentation mingling, one question has stuck with me ever since. It was 1991 and she said, how do you reconcile wearing lipstick with your work on feminist pedagogy? <laughs> this time, the request to reconcile meant aligning my ideas with a certain physical presentation of myself. An intellectual response came readily drawing on Foucault's notion of technologies of the self, Henrique's critique of the unified rational subject, and uh, uh, any number of uh, feminist post-structuralist theorists. But at an emotional and corporeal level, the question cut more deeply, such that I continue to think about how to style myself appropriately for different contexts, how to dress as the Radford lecturer. I took advice from a couple of colleagues today, choosing between two outfits, how to reconcile my ageing body with the hip person inside. <laughs> oh, you laugh. <laughs> Over the 26 years since, I've been asked similar kinds of questions, demanding that I reconcile different parts of my work. When I conducted my first ARC study on power relations in pedagogy, for example, I was asked how is this analysis of micro-level power relations in classrooms critical? And with my recent study of teacher development, I've been asked on multiple occasions, how do you reconcile your work on post-structural theory with conducting a randomised controlled trial? These are all important questions to ask. They raise questions of intellectual integrity and the commensurability of theories and methodologies. They challenge us. They challenged me to clarify my thinking, to read more about the epistemological foundations of ideas that appealed, to justify my academic raison d'etre, and to carefully consider my potential contribution. Questions like these are provocations, to refine what we do and why, and to clarify who we are and want to be. But as I want to argue today, they also function in unhelpful ways, 
to label individuals and limit our engagement with each other's work. And I think that plays a significant role in hampering the growth and the standing of education research. So in today's lecture, I want to use my own experience to explore what it means to reconcile as education researchers, a theme I'm going to carry through the four main sections to the presentation. A quick view of the field, uh, talk about numbers, uh, putting multiple techniques to work using a couple of case studies of the work I'm doing with colleagues at Newcastle, and then returning to the conference theme of transforming education research. As we know, education research encompass, encompasses a vast array of paradigmatic, theoretical and methodological perspectives, most of which are represented at this conference. Arguably, this range has both expanded on the one hand and limited on the other work done in the name of education research. When I first attended AERA, for example, in New Orleans in 1988, there were 12 divisions and 85 special interest groups. Now, AERA lists 13 divisions and 155 SIGs. Additions to the list of SIGs have brought important new theories, theorists, epistemologies and methodologies to light, each with a community of scholars large enough to earn the status of special interest group, each doing important work. But the sheer breadth also contributes to a diffusion of the field of education research, such, such that many of us don't engage with, let, a, let alone attempt to see the value in perspectives not aligned with our own. At conferences like this, we attend the sessions of our students, peers and heroes, rarely venturing into unfamiliar territory. I do it myself. In Australia, more than in other parts of the world, and perhaps because we are a smaller community of scholars, we, are, we have only 23 SIGs, certain perspectives have risen to ascendancy and profoundly shaped the field. Not only its current form, but its likely future. Deep lines of demarcation are drawn between sociological and psychological perspectives and qualitative and quantitative methods, despite the growing recognition that these debates are somewhat old, in the sense of both long-standing and tired, tiresome even. And yet many of us are identified or identify ourselves in relation to particular theorists, theories, traditions or methodologies, and we defend what is critical or feminist or valid or trustworthy about our work. Think about how these Australian researchers are known. Apologies uh, to all of you who should be up there and are not pictured and apologies to all of you who are pictured for the images that I've selected and, and how they're presented. But I don't think I'm alone in sensing that we've been expected to reconcile who we are as education academics with what we do as educational researchers, often in surprisingly unified ways. Bourdieu's notion of the empirical and epistemic individual is helpful here. The epistemic individual is how people become known through social analyses of our field, in my case, early on, before Martin, uh, as a critical pedagogue or a feminist post-structuralist or a qualitative researcher, for example, while the empirical individual is the real person whoever that is, but, you know, Jenny Gore. I'm suggesting that expectations of epistemological conformity and methodological purity mean that we, the empirical individuals, end up feeling compelled to perform the epistemic self, sometimes in ways that mean we restrict ourselves, excluding perspectives outside of our own. The particular ascendancy of critical perspectives and qualitative methods in Australia in recent decades means that we have a whole generation of educational researchers who can interrogate policy, deconstruct texts, craft narratives, analyse discourses, conduct interviews and write often beautiful and poignant accounts of lived experience while glazing over at the very side of numbers and groaning at the mention of RCTs. With more than 1,100 attendees at AARE this year, I suspect less than 5% of us could run a regression analysis. I can't, but I'm so grateful that I work with colleagues who can. 
Now, some of you might say that employing quantitative forms of research means buying into the calculable, measurable, performative and conservative agenda of neoliberalism. But as Alan Luke points out, powerful presuppositions operate to maintain the qualitative-quantitative divide, including the idea that quantitative research necessarily travels with neoliberal reform and is antithetical to the project of social justice, or that qualitative research is necessarily empowering transformative and progressive countering existing forms of hegemony and domination. I was reading a piece in the UK Conversation last week that Jeff Whitty actually put me onto. It was written by an academic in journalism, Andrew Calcutt, who argued rather provocatively that postmodernism played a role in spawning, not creating, but spawning the kind of post-truth politics that led to Brexit and to Trump's election. And by the way, post-truth was recently announced as the Oxford Dictionary's Word of the Year. Uh, for 2016. Last year, it was the face with tears of joy emoji. <laughs> I'm still not sure how that's a word, but I think 2015 uh, was overall a happier year. Uh, but back to post-truth, an adjective denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Calcutt argues that our intellectual arguments about multiple truths have contributed to both the endless spin of truth in politics and in the media, and to a loss of confidence in evidence, since everything is partial. He concludes, and I quote, instead of blaming populism for enacting what we set in motion, it would be, it would be better to acknowledge our shameful part in it. As others have argued in response to this provocation, there's an important distinction to be made between recognising that truth is constructed, partial and inextricably linked with power on the one hand, and on the other, the kind of outright lies that have been told by the likes of Trump, Gove, Johnson and co. Indeed, Aaron Banks, the multimillionaire who put seven million, uh, seven million pounds of his own money into the Brexit campaign, apparently engaged a Washington campaign strategy firm to advise leave, e leave EU. After the referendum, he said what they said early on was facts don't work, and that's it. The Remain campaign featured fact, 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 fact. It just doesn't work. You have to connect with people emotionally. I want to think more about this argument in relation to educational research. We've certainly seen the rise of opinion and appeals to emotion shaping education policy rather than rigorous evidence. I wonder to what extent the rejection of positivism and the concomitant recognition of the multiplicity and partiality of truths has contributed, contributed to the relatively low status of education research and the lack of respect we sometimes feel in policy and political circles and even within some of our own universities. As someone who continues to make use of Foucault in my own work, I'm not reneging on the importance or value of these kinds of approaches within education. We must continue to address how discourses function and the effects of the power knowledge nexus. But it does give pause for thought, including thought about how we in education research can avoid being subjected to more post-truth policy making. I want to propose as many have done before me, that numbers are not our enemy in education research, and that it is possible to reconcile, and here's just one definition, restore friendly relations between the kind of emancipatory commitments that many of us bring to our research and quantitative approaches to conducting that research, to reconcile emancipatory projects with post-positivist methodologies. Numbers are often seen as the very essence of the critical pro projects many of us advocate in and beyond education. For instance, improving health um, outcomes for Aboriginal people, removing refugee children from detention, addressing domestic and family violence, overcoming the pay gap for women. But despite what I said earlier about post-truth evidence, numbers are also paramount to having an influence with politicians, policy makers, vice chancellors, as well as the media, the public, and practitioners. 
The desire for numerical evidence and even RCTs can't simply be dismissed as the evil effects of the neoliberal regime. As Anne Oakley argued in the context of feminism, quantitative methods, uh, without quantitative methods, that social movement wouldn't have got very far. She explains that knowledge about the oppression of women in various domains has consistently pointed beyond how individual women feel to the ways in which women as a group are slotted into and treated by prevailing social and economic structures. The latter requires quantitative analysis. In education, quantitative research and experimental methods are often poorly, under, mis, poorly understood. For example, I wasn't aware until I got involved in one recently that good quality randomised control trials, the so-called pin, pinnacle of experimental methodologies, often include qualitative methods. This is because it's insufficient, especially in a field as complex as education, to gather evidence that something works without exploring how, why, for whom, and under what conditions. Before simply dismissing the approach as misguided, I urge you to look at Paul Connolly's keynote address uh, from Vera uh, in 2015, in which he provides, I think, a succinct and persuasive overview of what RCTs are good for and what, in his words, they are rubbish at. Um, they are limited. I'm not talking about simply adding a bit of qualitative data as a gesture toward methodological diversity, but instead actually designing RCTs to gain insights that can be interpreted and applied in meaningful ways in the messy realities of poli policy and practice. This is really important to avoid the danger that besets so many educational reforms of implementing fast and learning slow as Tony Bryke has said. That is, using weak evidence from one context and quickly applying it across whole school systems without adequately understanding the particular conditions under which it was found to work. He gives the example of the small schools in the, U the US. They found that dropout, dropout rates were less in smaller high schools. So in certain districts, they built a whole lot of small high schools as if the building was going to change uh, the outcomes for students. There's so much more, of course, that impacts on um, the experience of students and the outcomes in any setting. The current global push for evidence, evidence-informed practice, evidence-informed policy and so on, provides a really easy, uh, easy target for critique, particularly in this so-called post-truth era. But as education researchers, we can't simply dismiss this discourse. We need to respond with nuanced and sophisticated high quality evidence informed by multiple perspectives. Otherwise, policymakers and practitioners will continue to make it up for themselves. Fads will continue to reign in schools and real change will continue to elude us. In the remainder of the presentation, I want to explore what it might mean to reconcile quantitative and experimental research traditions with, with emancipatory research endeavours oriented at equity, social justice, empowerment. Foucault challenged us to know how and to what extent it might be possible to think differently instead of legitimating what is already known. And as many of you know, Bourdieu says of sociology, we need to question and constantly challenge methodological prescriptions. He says, social research is something much too serious and much too difficult that we can allow ourselves to mistake scientific rigidity for scientific rigour and thus to deprive ourselves of this or that resource available in the full panoply of traditions of our discipline. He also says we must, whenever possible, mobilise and put to work all of the techniques which are relevant and practically usable given the definition of the problem under investigation. And that's the anchor I keep coming back to, the problem under investigation. For me, as I argued last year in the Carolyn Baker Memorial Lecture at, I, at UQ, running through all of my research, along the bottom line there, <laughs> are commitments to improving teaching and increasing equity. Oh, we've had a format problem, never mind. Um, while, uh, while supporting teachers and doing so in ways that seek greater clarity about what, it might, uh, what we might do in education, while at the same time recognising that nothing is simple and that we must continue to problematise. These five commitments running along the bottom have driven all of my research. Across the top, 
um, in terms of everything I've done really from my earliest work on reflection and teacher socialization through the critical feminist pedagogy interests, the regimes of truth analysis, my micro level analysis of power relations, the Queensland School Reform longitudinal study, the work on quality teaching and now quality teaching rounds with the randomized control trial and my work on aspirations. These commitments are the threads that make it possible for me to reconcile the different directions in which I've gone, the underlying commitments. So to make my argument about why numbers are helpful in emancipatory projects, I'll draw on two current programs of research that I'm leading, one on student aspirations and the other on teacher development. I acknowledge that many other education researchers, including many people in this room, are conducting similar kinds of work. But given my history as someone who has moved from research that's primarily qualitative to a position that embraces both of those sides of the binary, which I also accept is problematic, and there's all these nuances and caveats I'd love to put around this work that I can't possibly do in 45 minutes or less. But I wanted to use this occasion to reflect on how the shifts I've made have led to some pretty exciting new insights. I aim to demonstrate how apparently incommensurate approaches have been brought together meaningfully in this work to enrich the studies, contribute to the research training of a team of RAs and PhDs, and contribute to the authority and influence of the work in various social spheres, all of which I trust will enhance its legacy. So to go to the first project on the educational and career aspirations of Australian school students. The project was subtitled Understanding Complexity for Increased Equity, signalling the contribution we wanted to make and our recognition of the work as political with an explicit goal of increasing equity. The study was positioned in the context of government policies to widen participation in higher education, ensuring access for a greater proportion of the population and especially people from disadvantaged backgrounds. Our recognition of complexity was intended to bring a critical lens to the work rather than risk adopting unproblematic definitions of problems or simplistic solutions. We framed the problem as a large scale longitudinal study informed by diverse notions of capital and other theoretical perspectives on equity, including feminist theories, the work of Apigurai, and social psychological theories of, of development. We use qualitative and quantitative techniques for data collection and analysis to shed light on complex factors involved in aspiration formation and the way they vary for students from different social groups. Importantly, we amassed a large data set um, and I'm not going to read the numbers, but you can see them there in terms of surveys of teachers, students and parents and focus groups with teachers, students and parents. Um, and working with a pretty geographically diverse group of schools from um, Sydney through to the Queensland border, mostly on the eastern seaboard. The project design enabled us to explore a host of demographic variables related to equity concerns, gender aboriginality, SES, location, language background as well as factors relating to schooling, such as school achievement, school exia, uh, whether students were having out of school tutoring and their sense of their own relative academic standing. Today I want to focus on some of the insights that have emerged from our analysis of the quantitative data. And there's so much qualitative data, but I won't be sharing that with you today. But I've selected four insights I want to share very briefly, each showing some surprising results. First, as just published in AER, and I think um, mentioned on the blog this morning, we identified that prior achievement in the presence of the other variables up there was not a significant predictor of interest in teaching as a career among school students. This has enabled us to make a potentially important incursion into current policy obsessions with recruiting the best and brightest, or the top 30% of the population. As it turns out, many high-achieving school students are interested in teaching. We argue that if more of them are to go on and enrol in uh, teaching and apply for teaching, we need to put more energy into nurturing the interest that exists, rather than focus so much policy effort on selection and regulation of entry to teacher education in ways that reinforce negative messages about the existing teaching workforce. We argue that if the political discourse continues to convey the powerful message that teachers are not good enough, 
we risk deterring the very high achieving students that are so sought after. As a second example, we identified that gender was a significant predictor of interest in nearly every occupational category. This is hardly news, but our research confirms how gender stereotypical views of occupations form early, as early as year three, and remain pretty intransigent despite feminist and other, e other efforts over many decades now. Just reading from left to right, for those of you who might not be able to see the small print, the columns, we've got females in grey, males in yellow. 9% um, of females are interested in engineering, the far left column, and then reading across we have defence, sports, STEM, broadly, science, architecture, law, medicine, arts, social work, teaching, veterinary, science and nursing. And very um, traditionally gendered in a whole lot of ways, although again there's some nuance there. But one of the really interesting and somewhat surprising results here, in, especially in light of widely publicised concerns about the participation of women in STEM, is the fact that the level of interest in science careers for girls was almost identical to that of boys. It's the column that's fifth from the left. 47% of those who expressed interest in science-related careers were girls. It suggests that at school, girls are interested in science at least, which provides a platform for ongoing, perhaps even intensified initiatives to nurture that interest if more girls are to choose STEM degrees and want to work in STEM careers. Again, there's a lot of complexity around that issue. Third, we considered how aspirations differed in specific communities involved in the study. For example, we compared the aspirations of students on the New South Wales Central Coast, an area with very high levels of poverty, with those of students in the broader sample. And although only 9% of adults on the Central Coast have degrees, which is considerably lower than the state average of 13%, kids on the Central Coast held occupational and educational aspirations that were not very different from the aspirations of students in the wider sample. And I won't go into the detail of the numbers there, but I think the impression is, is all I wanted to convey. This similarity signals important work to be done in schools and communities and through university outreach to maintain and support students' aspirations rather than assume that children and young people in these communities have already circumscribed and compromised, to use Godfredson's term, on what they see as possible. Fourth, we were blown away by this graph. It shows that aspirations for university are quite similar for Indigenous and non-Indigenous students in the lowest three achievement quartiles using LAP NAPLAN data, but the highest achieving Indigenous students, in yellow on the far right, were considerably less likely than high achieving non-Indigenous students to have aspirations for university, thus highlighting an aspect of underrepresentation that requires more attention if greater parity of access is to be achieved. There's much more to explore here, including a chasm between the possibility of making it to uni, surely possible for those in the highest achieving quartile, and the desirability of such a pathway. In many ways, it's not all that surprising, given the well-founded historical mistrust of educational institutions among Indigenous people, differential access to social and cultural capital of a kind that normalises participation in higher ed, cultural values, the capacity to aspire, and much more. The numbers here, though, have brought our attention to a pattern we weren't expecting. And they highlight the importance of our collective energy towards reconciliation, as Peter so beautifully uh, articulated this morning. Some of these findings are elaborated in other sessions of the conference. I've touched on them briefly here to highlight insights from our analysis of the quantitative data with clear relevance to policy practice and theory in relation to equity. There's much more work to be done with this data set, including more longitudinal analysis and more theorising. But reconciling quantitative work with emancipatory goals was not at all difficult in this project. Turning now to the teacher development research, I venture even further into what some would consider the dark side of empirical research, outlining the randomised control trial we've just completed. There are actually few examples of RCTs in education in Australia. In the UK, on the other hand, Paul Connolly's systematic analysis identified more than 800 trials that met the stringent criteria in education this was, 41% of which had a qualitative component. 
Conducting a randomised controlled trial has been especially helpful in our project of trying to support teachers to enhance student learning, including more equitable learning. It helped us to test and to demonstrate what we thought we knew from previous studies in ways that are now more persuasive to others, some others. Quality Teaching Rounds uh, as a project was conceived by Julie Bow and me in 2007 as a way of teachers working with each other using the quality teaching pedagogical framework to analyse and refine their individual and collective practice. Again, I don't have a lot of time to go into any detail about this, but these are the elements. And I think what you see is this is not a simplistic um, technical form of pedagogy. There's a lot in this model that's about how we treat knowledge, how we treat students, how we address questions of equity and so on. Um, although we documented in previous studies a number of positive effects, mainly with qualitative data, it was clear that we'd struggled to make it available, this model, beyond New South Wales and the ACT, who'd already picked it up, without the kind of evidence that an RCT provides. It would be just another approach that teachers said they found valuable. We believed and can now demonstrate with some pretty convincing evidence that it's worth thinking about, at least, for pre-service and in-service teacher development. The most exciting finding from this study was the quality of teaching, sorry, was that the quality of teaching for the intervention groups, two variations of quality teaching rounds, improved measurably, while the control group showed no change. And just a word on control groups. As with many RCTs in education, ours was a so-called waitlist control group with full access to quality teaching rounds at the 12-month point when the study ended. This addresses a common criticism of RCTs that participants in the, in the control group miss out. They don't have to. Our measure for quality teaching was based on observations of whole lessons where our researchers were blinded to group allocation. That means they didn't know whether they were watching a teacher, uh, watching a lesson taught by a teacher in a control group or in an intervention group. It's part of the rigour. There was no guarantee we'd see any difference between groups. But with effect sizes of 0.4 at the end of the intervention period, during which time some teachers were involved for as little as four half days doing quality teaching rounds, this actually represents a very significant outcome, especially given the enormous complexity of classrooms and the range of factors that might have impacted on these results. Follow-up observations that we conducted six months later actually in the following school year, also showed some sustainability of the gains made. We'd love to go back and see whether these improvements are still evident over a longer time period. Teachers certainly say to us that they can't go back once they've internalised this conception of quality teaching. When we removed from the analysis a couple of groups that didn't implement quality teaching rounds according to our protocol, which is a legitimate form of analysis because you can really only report if something made a difference, if we know that something was done. The results were even stronger, and just to pop that up very quickly, um, you see even stronger effects when it was done according to the protocol. The rigour of the randomised control trial with randomly assigned groups, blinded observers, baseline measures and implementation fidelity checks along the way enabled us to develop greater confidence in the quality teaching rounds approach which itself has strong conceptual and empirical foundations I don't have time to go into. If you're interested, though, you might want to attend Julie Bowe's session tomorrow where she's reporting on her uh, PhD work in quality teaching rounds. Where other researchers have shown impacts of professional development on teaching, it's mostly been limited to a single subject area, single lesson, or a small strategy within a teacher's repertoire. The quality teaching model applies across all subject areas and year levels and therefore has potential to support all teachers in a way that builds their confidence and their capacities to analyse and enhance their own and each other's practice, practice. The approach doesn't rely on experts or coaches, but amounts to teachers doing it for themselves, which also means it's readily scalable. These results not only strengthen claims we might want to make about the efficacy of this approach, but the studies generated other insights with important implications. As just one example, we were able to test assumptions about the potential moderating effects of years of teaching experience 
using the 1,073 lessons that were observed over the course of the study. These lessons were taught by a pretty representative group of um, government school teachers in New South Wales, working in a diverse set of schools. And what was really fascinating was to find no significant difference in the quality of teaching among beginning and experienced teachers, an absolute flat line. So years of experience along the vertical axis and quality teaching, um, you can see the scatter plot uh, showing that diversity. It's fascinating, as I said, to find no significant difference between these two. The graph is pretty confronting for many people. Either we're doing a great job in universities of preparing graduates who are ready to hit the ground running, or classroom ready, as goes the current parlance, or teachers, on the whole, are not receiving, experiencing professional learning in ways that impact on the quality of their teaching. Our randomised controlled trial shows that quality teaching rounds might be one way to intervene in this pattern and better support teachers in continually enhancing their practice. I emphasise supporting teachers because we hope to show that teaching could be improved without adopting the kind of oppressive accountability regimes associated with teacher assessment that increasingly dominate in the US and the UK. Not only did we show positive effects on teaching, but we also used Peter Hart's psychological scales in our survey of participating teachers to consider any impact on teachers' morale and sense of recognition and appraisal for their work. And these slides show positive effects again. So the three groups. Interestingly, um, the six-month point was November, December, when teachers' uh, morale is notoriously at a bit of a low point. Um, but what we see with the two intervention groups is that overall the effect on morale was positive. And similarly with the scale on appraisal and recognition, that same kind of pattern where the control group didn't um, experience the same kind of gains that we saw. Now we didn't design this study or end the analysis with only quantitative data. We wanted to put multiple research methods and methodologies to use. To gain qualitative insights into the experience, we interviewed teachers. From the analysis, we gleaned three key mechanisms that help explain why quality teaching rounds were successful. We'd argue that it structures the knowledge base for teaching, it flattens power hierarchies among teachers that are typically based on experience and inter institutional position, and it enhances relationships to build a culture of learning among teachers. We found that building relationships among teachers was part of what happened at the most basic level where people got to know each other. Here we have a teacher saying it's good to work with people I don't normally work with. I got to know one lady, I didn't even realise she was a teacher before, I thought she was a parent who didn't leave. <laughs> Uh, so just at the most basic level, or this one from a very experienced teacher saying they didn't like me, people working in her group, and I didn't like them, and it was only on hearsay and reputation. But when I was in the room with them and working with them, I respected them, and I learned to trust them, and I learned who they really were. That's the kind of power uh, and importance of the qualitative data that goes along with the qualitative work. We've also used a Foucauldian lens to consider the discursive subjectification and lived effects using Carol Barchi's work on both beginning teachers and on experienced teachers. We've conducted detailed case studies uh, of the experience in particular schools drawing on ethnographic traditions. One of our colleagues has started undertaking a conversation analysis linked with ethnomethodology to consider at a fine-grained level the conversational moves and the work done in professional learning communities. We're looking at implementation in small schools and the use of digital technologies for thinking about how we support teachers in contexts where teachers often miss out on PD altogether. Even more critically, in terms of current policy settings, we're also wanting to see if impact on student learning outcomes can be demonstrated probably with another RCT. In this project, the different traditions of experimental science, qualitative research and post-structural analysis have been brought together in meaningful ways. As with the aspirations work though, we've only really scratched at the surface of what is a substantial program of work drawing on those different traditions. Moving towards my conclusion. Um, as I said earlier, many others have argued that we need to consider the benefits of drawing together different traditions of research in the social sciences, but fewer people have demonstrated how they do it. 
That's what I wanted to do today within the time limit set for this Radford lecture. I hope I've shown some productive and defensible ways of crossing methodological and epistemological boundaries. When Michael Apple asked how I reconcile my post-structural analysis of pedagogical discourses, you could have guessed, right, uh, with the harsh realities of living in poverty, I replied that none of us should be in the academy if we didn't feel there were important contributions to be made in the intellectual work we do. 26 years later, I feel more grateful for his question than I did at the time. The demand to reconcile was effectively a call to be mindful of the relationship between our intellectual choices and our responsibilities as academics. Francois Ewald, who was a student of Foucault's, once said, we have a responsibility with regard to the way we exercise power. We must not lose, this, lose sight of the idea that we could exercise it differently. I think being clear about how our work matters might become even more important given the current context in which we find ourselves as educators and researchers. As a nation, we've been pursuing equity and social justice agendas at least since the launch of the Disadvantaged Schools Program in 1974. And yet we still have a long way to go, with many issues as relevant now as they were four decades ago. There are wonderful opportunities for us to come together across apparent boundaries to explore new perspectives on the important projects in which we're engaged. Whether we're interested in PISA results across nations, the consequences of the marketization of education, supporting LGBTIQ students and teachers, improving outcomes for Indigenous students, exploring literacy and numeracy effects of interventions or demonstrating the impact of teacher education. All of these questions can be approached from multiple perspectives. I'm often reminded of something Bourdieu said in a lecture I had the privilege of attending while in Madison. It went, it went something like, in social science, we should never attempt to be more clear than reality. Reality in education is messy and complex. To reconcile is to find a way, another definition here, in which two situations or beliefs that are opposed to each other can agree and exist together. I hope I've gone some small way toward demonstrating how different approaches can not only exist together, even if they have fundamentally different epistemologies on which they can't agree, but that they can produce new and important insights. If we can reconcile some of the differences that have divided and weakened us, we uh, can move forward in really exciting new possibilities um, that have the potential to play a role in transforming education research. Thank you.